Welcome, everybody. We're looking this week at Chapter 13, Information Theory by Richard Hanning. Uh, very important topic associated with Dr. Hamming and his work. All right, so uh, learning to learn information theory. Hamming had a very close relationship with this topic. He worked for years at Bell Labs and he was in the in close proximity to Claude Shannon. And so he is going through in this chapter on what are the aspects of information theory and what do they mean? And this point about surprise is really important because when you mention we want to measure information, you quickly almost immediately get right to, well, what is information? And the notion that, well, if you already know something, is it information or not? If you don't know something, then you're surprised. You're learning something that you didn't know. So clearly that case, there's information present. And that notion of surprise is a very powerful way to put some kind of metric, fundamental metric, on the nature of information. We're going to see that this plays in multiple directions, not all of which are computational. In Hanning's example, he gives Smoggy in LA, not much of a surprise, but it's fun to read in there that he says, but if it's Raining in Monterey in June, that would be a surprise. And indeed, today is May 15th, and it's not raining. It's not raining today, so that's not surprising. Okay, but if it was raining, that would be an alert. And, of course, we have a weather system because of the surprise. The nature of that information is valuable to people. They can act on it if they know about it. Then the next level of this is when we look at, there we go, when we start drilling down on that, we go, oh, okay, okay. Do you know it or do you not? That, that might initially be considered a Boolean or true false. Well, you know it or you don't know it, you know, and I'm sure some of you have experienced or used that question on uh, qualification boards and uh, preparation for different thresholds. You know it or you don't know it. And and maybe academically you can sort of fake it sometimes or deal with the problem. But if you're in a strict professional situation, depending on your expertise, well, you either know it or you don't know it is pretty good thumb roll. So if there are cases where we maybe know it, and we think we know it, or we're kind of sure we know it, oh, oh, so this, we could assign a probability to that information being known. If we say a unit of information, a chunk, an event as listed here, is probability of some piece of information, then how much information is there given that we have a lot of events, a lot of data points, a lot of bits, they drive through, well, that's, that's a probability P. And multiple probabilities are P1, P2. You can go through to a large number of these things. And, oh, and so the if P is the, if we take the inverse of that, the probability of information versus surprise, and then because, as, as you well know, reciprocal equations are hyperbolic and asymptotic, we, we not only take that reciprocal, but we apply a log to it to try to normalize it, to try to straighten it out in terms that are useful, then a bunch of math can quickly come into play. And it's fun watching Hamming describe that. 
Now, I had the benefit when I first heard him talking about this stuff to hear to be in his, another course by Dr. Hanning. And that, that course was Probability and Statistics for Computer Science Students. What does that mean? Well, that means that they didn't trust us to take the full strength mathematics department course or operations course. We got the, well, probability statistics are awfully close, smash them together. And second, that they tried to jam a whole bunch into one quarter, a whole bunch of information. Third, since that was a service course, some kind of, well, everybody has to take probability and statistics. It wasn't hugely popular amongst the faculty. A lot more, you know, almost faculty, naturally, they want to be off on the most advanced thing, things that might support their research, things that might help their students get into thesis topics. So probability and statistics was a lot closer to bread and butter than it was to the cutting edge. So, so I still remember this course. It, show of hands, how many in this, how many people in this room today uh, have been in a uh, probability and statistics course before? One, two, three, four, or five visible. How about verbals for you other folks? Uh, oh, there's one, six Wayne, of nine. Sinker, yes. Seven of nine. Mike and Lauren. I'm pretty pretty darn sure Lauren My has. Hands up. You can see the little blue thing, can't you? Oh, you. Have, why do you have a blue hand and Bird have a yellow hand? What was that about? I've been disintermediated again. Thank you, Lauren. Bird we'll, chose uh, we'll a plot, leave. and I took uh, the the raised hand option from underneath participants. Thank you. Well, if this pretty pretty heavy duty group is eight out of nine, then the probability is probably high that graduate student Mike also went to. But he's in it. Certainly, a lot of people have a passing familiarity with with uh, probability and statistics. Okay, next question. How many people noticed when you took this course that it was an exhilarating, pleasant, cheerful, students couldn't wait to arrive each day kind of pedagogical experience? Any hands on that one? John, your hand's still raised. Is that is that just an icon or? Okay, oh, oh something went down there. Okay, I'm seeing a vast wasteland, of, which I will infer as uh, zero, probably a zero, or at least for an eight out of nine sample space. So, yes, indeed, when I took the course, even from Hamming, it was pretty rough sledding for a lot of people. Because isn't it interesting? One of the, I mean, he, he developed numerical analysis. Hamming said, why, well, sure, I'll teach it. This is important. And he's a mathematician. And so this is a subject he knows deeply. So you got to imagine, not that it was very evident to us as first quarter grad students, you got to imagine that for everything he said, there were 93 things he didn't say in that course. Because, you know, this is, this is like teaching how do you make words and sentences out of the alphabet. All, all the essence of probability and what it means. And, and you know, there was a healthy sprinkling of Hemming stories throughout this and making examples of combinatorics. And that always helps when you teach a course like that. Okay, so we got to the midterm. And I might have given you a short form of this before, but this is worth repeating. We got to the midterm. This is the only time I saw a class distribution like this. There was great anxiety amongst the students and very, very varied after action reports when we traded notes. So we get back to class the next week and he 
hands out all the exams. He, we use transparency. He went through every slide, every problem. Here's how you solve it. There were no real surprises. I mean, all of the material had been things, problems we'd worked out in class before and things like that. And then at the end, he put, he put the grading distribution up and, and we had, I don't know, 28 students in that class. It was pretty close to 30, you know, the uh, statistically meaningful sample. And it was a linear distribution. On a on a 100% scale, it stretched from three to 97. Sprinkled all the way, and it, it was it was a uniform linear triangle distribution all the way up, and it was like. So of course there was already a lot of grimacing in the class before that went up because he'd handed out the papers and then everybody handed. It. So then surprise. Hamming says, well, clearly I have failed to teach you probability. So therefore, before we go onward to statistics in the second half of the class, I'm gonna teach you probability again, and the administration can figure out when you're taking statistics at another time. <laughs> Okay, one last survey question there. How many people have been in that class before? Where the instructor said, clearly I failed, and I will now teach you. Okay, so I offer that because it's revealing on multiple levels, not least of which is the level of importance Hamming put on people understanding the nature of probability. What does it mean to have an event or probability, et cetera, and commentary? And implicit was, what is he going to teach us about statistics if half the class or more understands half of probability or less? What could he possibly teach us that was meaningful about statistics? I think so that that was pretty interesting. Welcome back to screen sharing. I can find the lesson button here. All right, so very important skill. And I'm gonna jump right over that. Hamming, in this chapter, he kind of hints at it ambiguously at the beginning when it's first mentioned, but he's very clear about it here get the quote. I wanted to read this one because I think since it's a matter of consternation, but right at the very beginning of the chapter, the management of Bell Telephone Labs wanted Shannon to call it communications theory as that was a far more accurate name. But for obvious publicity reasons, information theater theory has a much greater impact. This is the name that Jim chose, and so it is known to this day. Okay, so interesting, interesting, interesting. Here's Hamming playing once again at multiple levels, not least of which is what's the meaning? What's the meaning of this thing? What's the meaning of an event? What's the meaning of a unit of information? What's the probability of surprise? What is this real? Is this communication theory? Maybe it should be called data communication theory. Is it information theory? Well, we, it's not that Shannon was wrong. It's just that this was pushing against the common human understandings and human understandings that play at different levels but are intertwined. And so over the years, I've certainly found when we do, you know, we do a lot of modeling and simulation. Boy, you want to screw everybody up, use the wrong name for something. Okay, so use the right names. It's worth asking yourself, am I calling my, things in my work the right name? What's their impact? We'll see.
repercussions of that as well. Let's keep going. Okay, and this is very interesting because he talks several times about definitions themselves and how they color how you think about the problem. They color how, how you communicate with others about the problem. They color, they influence how you dissect it, how you try to solve it. And that if your definitions are screwy, that muddies all the water. So in, in spirit of Hanning, I'd offer the flip side. Gee, when you're in a situation where all the definitions are screwy and nothing's making sense, hmm, maybe it's time to re-examine your definitions. Oh, that's just the first person perspective of what he's saying right here. You've got to re-examine those definitions and over and over again, people just keep building on them and where they go. Okay, so now here's another similar definitional issue. Fundamentally important, fundamentally powerful. What's the average amount of information here? Well, if it was P corresponded to surprise and the inverse of surprise is information that you're gaining out of it and you don't always know if it's all there so it's further probabilistic whether you're getting each unit then how much well you sum them all up i didn't just give you a bit of information but a pile of information and so how much is that all together and because they're all familiar with it oh and there's a track record here of picking popular terms to represent oh they called it well that's that's an entropy equation Deming points out that well it's really not the same it's not the same at all it's not the same relationship and i think experimentally observationally points out that a lot of people can easily get confused and have gotten confused about given they might have a deep knowledge of entropy thermodynamics entropy, applying those concepts in that direction. In fact, there's a project that was quite prominent for a number of years in the cyber domain at NPS that used thermodynamics principles such as entropy and other things to describe relationships and how they work. And, and well, okay, maybe there's some correspondences, but whenever it was briefed, I would sort of look around the room at, at expressions on people's faces and you could tell by the questions they asked those preconceptions of commonly used terms elsewhere, even when the mathematically they were similar or identical with different units, different domains, but the same mathematical relationship, the conceptual baggage of the original concept completely overwhelmed what the, precise definition was saying on there because of the term. Really interesting. And so given that it makes sense and given that they've gone all the way to theorems, there's still a lot we can pull out of the uh, math here. And I, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to duplicate the, the great master. It's I do uh, thank goodness that we had a good strong black marker uh, that day because he did a I think a very I think his drawing on the board, tracing the equations, walking you through them as they're here in the book in the printed chapters in the online chapters, he really teases the part, and it's clear he's not showing off. he's expecting every student to study their probability to follow along and and when you further consider. What is he not saying here? You realize, oh, this is quite a distilled presentation, as, as he even mentions. It's not trying to walk you through every detail of the theorem, as, as mathematicians might be want to do, but rather 
give you the sense of what they mean and how do they relate to you. And sure, there's math there, the language of clear thinking and strict relationships, but then we say, well, what does that mean? So, so that's the sense of the inequality. You're the Gibbs inequality. And it says, well, if, if we do indeed have a reciprocal logarithmic relationship, then tangent to that line is simply a linear line of y equals x minus one. And the insight there was that, oh, that represents the theoretical maximum of how much information you could shoehorn into a channel and maybe uh, evidently just looking at, oh, that's also the gap of how much unused information space might be there that could be utilized by an encoding. It's, it's further interesting to me when he talks about how error correcting codes, as, as we went through in the prior lecture, weren't around yet. So Shannon picked uh, random messaging, random code books. That's cool. That tells us a couple of things. Well, one, I think we could expect that if it's truly an information theory, a fundamental theory, you would expect them to start with a completely random, not worry about this encoding or that encoding, but have a general approach that works for any probability distribution that might occur. And, it, and indeed, there are decades of work in societies and proceedings and conferences today that are still exploring special cases of filters and sampling and inference and signaling and crosstalk effects, and uh, it goes on and on. So yes, fundamentally powerful theory. Something else that such an inequality tells you is is it worth the effort to try to improve this further? Okay, we're suboptimal, but how far suboptimal? This gives you a sense of it. Interesting and unusual. That's often not the case. So we're in, we're in an interesting play space here. I guess I missed my craft inequality and some more of the math, he goes through it and then Gibbs, and then all the way up to noiseless coding is, well, if we know how much information we could fit in there, then we know what a best case is and what's a less suboptimal case. And we know when something's impossible. Can't, can't put 10 pounds in a five pound bag. Mm, okay, and then oh, if this is represented as data, as bits, then I guess we know how long, how many bits we need. What's the average code, which we went through in the, in the Huffman encoding and the other uh, coding theory, what, what are those uh, ways of representing values? And when Huffman, the primary difference in Huffman being we could have variable length encodings what are efficient ways to keep the average length of the encoding short versus fixed length encodings where we say, well, if we have eight bits, then we could define an ASCII character set. Interesting. And then builds on it further and says, okay, well, if we know what information we can send, but we also know that there's noise, then how do we consider those delta cases? And uh, even works its way to four quadrant. Yes, it's correct. Yes, we got it. No, it's incorrect. No, we didn't get it. And permit and combinations. And so it helps you add the, the, he's giving you the distilled basic theory of how to figure out how long those codes are. I want to point out, oh yeah, I remember this one. This is the book that Shannon didn't write. 
And after a few years of frustration, Hamming said, well, if he's not going to write it, people have to know this. I'm going to write it anyway. And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm holding up the second edition here, which means even after Hamming wrote it, Shannon didn't, still didn't write it. <laughs> and that they're getting feedback into it. And you can see the skeleton of our presentation today in this book. So that also helps you if you want to do some intellectual anthropology and intellectual sleuthing and you want to say, well, what did Hamming distill out of the fundamental in meaning of information theory? Well, this is for the experts and then this is for the almost experts, not maybe not signal engineers, but people who need to know this. Okay, let's keep going. Was my camera coming across there or should I, I should have probably stopped the share. I've been waving the camera at the video, but that might just be postage stamps on the final video. So I'll do a dedicated uh, screenshot here of these two books that were working. Okay. Okay. So uh, you should be seeing the screen. What does it mean? Sufficiently large N. Oh, we've been here before. Right, and the encoding theory. Well, if if you're trying to capture a message set and there's some probability of error, one technique is, well, add more bits. And then the more bits you have, it doesn't matter at some point how many get smashed away. You can say, how much noise do I want to live with? Okay, make your encoding longer than that. That's all this says, all it takes advantage of. And he has some uh, excellent examples that are Quite intuitive in the video, worth watching. Don't don't flick it off when he starts going into math. I think I think there's a lot greater tendency to do that these days because because we have so many other majors and sciences that taking probability statistics, being adept at math, is not an everyday skill anymore. Maybe sad to say, but there you go. Okay, so this is this slide is the distillation of the things he's saying. And I like that last sentence, capacity is quite good. That sounds benign. Oh, it's good, it's bad, yeah. Usually you can always get those permissions. But in this case, you can measure it. So when he said it's quite good, you go, oh, because of information theory, we're able to measure just how effective we were, how close to the theoretical maximum efficiency. Context, once again, this is people trying to figure out how do we digitize everything? We're living in a primarily analog world. We're trying to digitize communications. How do we get those binary digits, information nuggets over a medium to a far side? In practice, I like to call this first one, first law of engineering. If it ain't broke, you don't fix it. <laughs> right. So if you've got error correction, if there's robust modes, if it mostly works, use it, please. That's the first lesson. You don't have to be totally befuddled by some of the complexity. and. Second, it is always a trade-off. That's what the bullets are describing here. Rust never sleeps, noise never sleeps. How much noise can you permit? What are the characteristics of noise, et cetera, et cetera. And so this slide is a bit of an iteration, reiteration of some of the principles we've seen a few times. But it, it's an interesting, this many years later to, to recognize that, oh, if Shannon didn't have error correcting codes and we could cross check, maybe it didn't, certainly didn't have much more than the rudiments of what Huffman was doing. The flip side of that is, but they did. 
they did. They took advantage of information theory, and that clearly influenced their design and because it's so coherent in how this is all working. Okay? And so that leads us now to his t some of his takeaways is even if it, something doesn't give you a recipe, a clear path how to get there, but it lets you measure, that's important. That's the first point there. And then the second point uh, in practice, if, if we have data communications are not the same as human communications, well, I got to say that that has been very influential in some of our work, and it's under a topic area called network optional warfare. If you have a lot of information known to either side, you don't have to tell everybody everything. You just have to indicate the, the key points. Way back, in the, somewhere far back in the last century, I, I used to be on a submarine that would ride to periscope depth and back at pretty regular intervals. You wanted to know where you were. And every once in a while, there was some problem that people on board couldn't get. They couldn't understand, they couldn't figure out, they didn't have enough information or other considerations. What do we do? Okay, so C story. When you get to that situation, it doesn't occur very often. It can happen. Get there. Usually you hear something uh, muttered like uh, the CEO says, XO, take us up. Okay. Yeah, we go ahead and go up and get up there. And standing officer gets on the satellite and says, and, and there's a pause. And a little while later, he gets a response back. And 37 seconds later, we're going back down. And the commanding officer gets on the microphone and says, now here it is, here's what we're doing, here we go, onward. Ask yourself. Okay, another show of hands. Have people seen that scenario, since we have a lot of military folks, that kind of command level scenario of terse, direct, pointed communications, utterly brief, getting an utterly brief response back yet having a giant unfolding effect when they report when they return to your unit has anybody else been in that situation one hand two hands three four i have okay yeah yeah Stinker. so i'm not telling you anything new oh this has crossed the main ah so if you ask yourself how did how did those people communicate at that level of comprehension and detail? Well, they were trained. Well, they had the vocabulary. Well, they knew the procedures and the techniques. And well, that's why they got qualified as commanding officer of that unit, that ship, that squadron, that, that battalion, whatever. Oh. Because there's already a mind share of what it is. So you can have utterly brief communications that say a lot. Okay, so this is like pushing past what Hamming's saying, but using the signpost that he gave us, that the information gives you guidance in directions to go. Let me roll you way back couple of hundred years. Has anybody been in uh, London before? We have a few Europeans on here, a few well-traveled. Okay, a couple of people. There's a very famous tall, tall, tall pillar with a statue on top, and it's so high that maybe only the birds know what he really looks like up there, but who? Anybody know whose statue that is? I'll give you a hint. It's in Trafalgar Square. Nelson. Admiral Horatio Nelson, Battle of Trafalgar. Okay, that's a really interesting battle, because, naval battle, 
because it had a couple of year wind up leading up to it. And you look at some of the core causes, you, you see two things. One is the British had an incredibly detailed signal book, signal book of remedy codes that was not only flashing light, but it was gunshots, it was clanging, it was bells, it was red rockets flying in the air. Because it was hard to communicate back then. Second thing was for two years prior, Admiral Nelson went around to every ship in his fleet. And and he would go to each boat and he'd sit down after dinner, they'd clear off the get table in the in the officer's mess and he'd lay out the charts and they'd start pushing toy boats around and talking. And he'd he'd walk people through, well, this is what I'm thinking, and this is what you need to do, and this is what you when the bombs start flying and the cannonballs and the fire and the splinters and everything else and boom and you can't hear this is what you got to do this is what it's all about okay that common conceptual picture is just by historians and probably anybody who reads about it is fundamental fundamental and how do you how do you train and organize with your people when you can't get a message through, even if you wanted to, because there's just too much noise, too much interference, too much denial. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So if we push beyond the, well, humans are not the same to, well, what else could we do about it? The notion of surprise is very powerful. Right? Oh, I don't have to tell them everything in real time. I just have to tell them what they need to know. Rephrase. I just have to tell them what they don't know. And if they know all the other stuff, then we're then we're having that 37 second conversation that only a handful of commanders in the world can actually conduct in the right place at the right time, saying the right thing, getting the right answer back of what they needed because they did have all of that context, mental model, vocabulary, situational awareness. So I offer that to you as, wow, here we go again. Here we go again with Hamming going in all these directions. Our name for how we're applying that right now is called Network Optional Warfare. And I'll leave you with one contrary sea story on that whole thing. I used to ask a question. I don't ask this anyone, this, anyone this question anymore. It's too painful. Well, was there any time your captain was really upset with communications? <laughs> so the most interesting answer I got, well, well, yeah. The only time the captain was upset was when we didn't meet our one hour reporting requirement to get all of our imagery pushed through the satellite and back down to the far end. Then he started climbing the curtains. <laughs> okay, other complete far end of the spectrum. That's not thinking of information is what do you need to know? That one hour requirement for imagery is thinking of information as bits, solely as bits. And if we only had enough bits everywhere, then we'd be good. Well, the, the battlefield is not that benign for any, any of the services or any of the nations. So I offer that to you in this sense that here we go again with Hamming and how do we make sense of this thing? And human communication plays on multiple levels. Okay, so let's see what's left. Yeah, definitions, color how you think. Also, pay attention. And when it looks like something's new, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. You don't even know if you're not asking the question. Okay, let's flip through as a finale then. Yeah, here's here's more of that. 
just to help with the uh you guys all know your latin and everything so i don't have to worry about you but for the video let's pull up the other word what's a tautology thank you okay tautology redundant use of words it is a tautology to say redundantly repetitive accountable raise to the ground is a tautology here's the real one in this context oh it's something that's always true statement that's always true if a statement's always true how much information is in that according to information theory how much information is in that statement None, because Anyone? the probability is one. Right. There's zero surprise. So there's no information because the probability is one. That they already know. It's always true. It's always true. What are you telling me? Sounds like you're telling me something, but you're not really. Okay. So here we go. So isn't this interesting? Minor C story. I don't want this to sound negative. So I don't know how to tell this. So bear with me. Shortly after this, first time I heard his lecture on that and you know, reading his stuff, at a class in our computer science department, and we had an excellent military instructor who got up there and tried to, he had a problem on an exam about, a quiz about how much information was here. And I didn't think the answer was right. And, you know, just the spirit of inquiry, you know, I'll go out and talk to him. And he's, the, he's the big guy and the experienced instructor. And I say, well, you know, it's this, but if you already know this, there's not that. And he said, no, 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 you're wrong. Totally certain in saying that. So, I'm saying, so I, hold up, I hold up his exam and I go, okay, if you gave me this exam, gave all of us, there's a certain amount of information on this sheet of paper. Correct? Right. Yeah, exactly right. And then if I have two copies of that same sheet of paper, it's not twice as much information. It's the same information. So, nope, nope. It's twice as much information. Now, at the time, I was like, whoa, <laughs> that can't be true. And very quickly, that's not true. For those two sheets of paper, it's not the same information. But isn't it curious if we apply the human factor to it, you might say, well, yeah, but for that 28 students, is that 28 sets of information and 28 sets of hands and 28 sets of eyes and brains? Context, very, very important, very important. In a pure sense, in a signaling sense, in a data sense, there's, uh, there's zero surprise in the second copy until that same information goes over there. Okay, how are we doing on time? I think we did about 45 minutes. I went a little longer on this time. 